Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, gentlemen and ladies. Welcome to Beauty Academy, an online webinar series created by Beauty Sourcing. My name is Selena. I will be your host today for this edition of webinar. We're delighted for you to join today. Before we get started, first of all, we will be kindly to ask you to use your desktop as we will show a lot of information and make sure you will get the most of it. Secondly, you will be muted, but if you have questions, you are encouraged to raise your questions. Please post your questions, but do not promote yourself during Q&A. We will have 10 minutes Q&A after all the presentation. Last, a copy of this webinar will be available at beautysourcing.com. Now, in case you haven't heard about beauty sourcing, beauty sourcing is an online platform for small, medium beauty and wellness entrepreneurs to source, connect, and learn. We power brands with digital solutions and services to help them to grow. Within beauty sourcing's ecosystem, there is three parts. First is beauty marketplace, a place to offer the most efficient way for beauty brand owners to source a shortest of qualified suppliers who have actively attended worldwide beauty trade shows. Next is Beauty Academy, a resources sharing platform for industry leaders to showcase their innovations, recognize their challenges, and deliver the information through interview and a series of online seminars. Last is Beauty Community, a community platform that empowers beauty industry players to share and grow the beauty business knowledge, ask questions and get quality answers right online. All right, help us things to launch here are four individuals who have their special skills in this, in this area. First one is Mark, who is the founder and manager director of Shanghai-based China Skinny one of China's best known marketing and research agencies. China Skinny has delivered research, strategy, and trends analysis for more than 200 international brands, including Nike, Aki, Panasonic, Tourist Australia, and IHG. China Skinny published the most read weekly newsletter about marketing to Chinese consumers. Mark has been quoted in more than 200 international media outlets including Bloomberg, FT, and Fubus, where he writes a regular column. Ms. Apple Gore, who works in CIRS Group for more than nine years and leads the personal and home care team to assist the global well-known personal and home care product companies and ingredient suppliers in regulatory compliance for thousands of products each year. She is always invited to give the training to foreign custom companies in the International Regulatory Conference. Teresa, the founder of Moment Z. Teresa graduated from University and started as an entrepreneur in beauty industry for four years. The last speaker is from Miro. Miro Lee is the founder of Double V Consulting and the China Bo Academy Brand Consultant and the China Market Entry Strategist, and she has specialized in Gen Z marketing. Okay, now we over to our first speaker, Mark Tanner. His topic will be on how to win the Chinese market and optimize your performance in China. Mark, over to you. Thanks, Selena. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, try and share my screen. Oh, it yeah. says I cannot start while the other participant is sharing. Can you, can you share your screen? There we go. All right, well, thank you for listening and joining us today. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share some insights uh, from China Skinny, uh, the numerous projects we've worked on, plus other trends we're seeing in the market. Uh, but one of the main sources of a lot of the insights I'll be sharing today is from our skincare tracker and beauty tracker, uh, which track both e-commerce data and consumer uh, quantitative data. Um, in real time. And so we have uh, a dashboard where you can really understand what's happening in the market. And so I'll share some examples and, and really hopefully bring them to life. 
uh, over over the next next presentation. Um, but just unfortunately, I'm unable to be here for the uh, Q and A at the end, and I do apologise. Um, so I'm going to try and go a little bit quicker through, and, and if you have any questions uh, specific to this presentation, uh, hopefully we can answer them after this. Um, so I guess everyone on everyone's lips is COVID, and if you're not living in China, it's probably even more uh, relevant um, with lockdowns and, and, and face masks and everything else. Um, China was, is, is, is well known, they contained uh, the virus here quite well. Um, there was really quite a big lockdown early on in late January, but by March, uh, things were quite a little bit getting back to normal. People were out um, shopping, people were out in the parks, and within a few months after that, life for the most part was back to normal, bar a few relatively isolated uh, lockdowns. But obviously beauty took quite a hit overall. Um, just on the Alibaba platforms, uh, they dropped 30% between January and March uh, when the main lockdown was. And I'm sure like many markets, people when they're sitting inside their apartments, uh, they're, they're not overly keen or they just don't have as much of a need to, to look their best. Um, but once the lockdown start, ended, things really boomed. Um, we saw things like and, and the week after the lockdown, people were allowed out again. Um, things like medical, cosmetic surgery and services, uh, dental services, all those kind of beauty type related things grew 3000% from online bookings. So absolutely massive. Um, there were a lot, there was quite isolated which areas of beauty were uh, impacted. Obviously, things like lipstick were, have been incredibly highly impacted, like everywhere with, with face masks. But things like eyeliner and, and eye beauty products really uh, did very well um, during the lockdown in particular. Um, the growth on for uh, foreign brands during that January to March for eye beauty grew 40% uh, online in China. Um, companies like L'Oreal actually did very well, although, although the, the overall market dropped, uh, they grew over 6% during uh, January to March. Um, so it, it's, it's been a mixed bag, but overall things are faring very well relative to, to other countries in the world. Um, and then looking overall, just with, with such a big hit, um, the retail did drop. 3.9% um, obviously uh, overall in, in the market. But something that was quite incredible was imported cosmetics grew last year 30%. And on the surface, that looks like an incredible number. And it looks like everyone's buying uh, foreign cosmetics. But in reality, it's not so rosy. Um, and, and you only need to know a little bit about the way Chinese used to shop their cosmetics. If, if you have a, there's been all sorts of comparisons, but a bag of cosmetics products, a bundle or a basket, uh, are 60% more in China than the equivalent bundle would cost in somewhere like Canada, which is one of the cheapest places in the world. So you've got a lot of consumers will travel, and obviously the biggest internationally traveling group in the world, making over 100 million trips a year prior to COVID. And there's also the massive Daigo. Uh, industry. So people buying on behalf, people that are out shopping uh, by order or just uh, buying a lot of things and advertising them on their WeChat and their social media accounts. Um, but with, with COVID, obviously people couldn't travel and Daigo, the trade really, really got hurt because uh, there was less reliability around uh, shipping and things like that and less people traveling to be able to buy this. So that's meant instead of buying overseas, a lot of those the customs being repatriated. We've seen that across all the luxury categories as well, but, but cosmetics was particularly um, well impacted. Um, so overall, imported cosmetics are going great in China, but not as well as they should. Um, the, the sea beauty or China beauty is actually growing faster in as, as a worldwide volumes. Uh, Chinese are, are, are tending to go more towards um, the domestic beauty in, in some cases. And it's not just because they, they love 
Chinese brands, although the, the appetite for Chinese brands is increasing and has increased with, with more nationalism and, and with COVID. Um, but a lot of it is just because a lot of the Chinese brands are much savvier and just understand the market and respond to the market a lot better. So I'm going to go through a few of those reasons why uh, over the next little bit. So here's Singles Day, and hopefully most of you have heard of Singles Day, Doubles 11, Double 11, um, the biggest shopping day on the planet. It's not actually a day. It's been pushed out to weeks. Uh, it starts in October and ends on the grand finale on uh, November 11th. Uh, it's, it's a really good opportunity, not just to, to sell lots of products, but a lot of consumers come there to be entertained and there's all sorts of brands doing some really good entertainment and also launching new products. There's a lot of great new products getting launched. So it's a good opportunity where you've got a lot of eyeballs and, and a lot of consumers that are curious and wanting to try new things. Um, but if you look at the China overall, and this is uh, through our tracker, tracking the e-commerce sales, um, foreign brands are killing it. They're really dominating during those two months of Singles Day, um, late October through to November 11th, which is by far the busiest time of the year. But outside of that, uh, the, the sales are not great at all. Overall, about a third um, in the rest of, for the rest of the year. And that is worrying as, as a foreign brand, particularly in the cosmetics category where people are buying more than once a year. Uh, really good to establish habits and particularly for cosmetics and, and just selling a whole lot of products generally discounted or with gift or purchase on those single days isn't as sustainable as it could be. And so I think it's really important as brands come in, and a lot of these brands are, are one show pony um, every every double eleven, but it's important to to try and really retain and have a really strong marketing calendar um, twelve months of the year to really build that habit and really create that habit. Now another thing that, that's really important in China is and everywhere in the world, I think more so in China than than any other market I've known, is that real push for personalization. And if you if you look at a market like China, there's one point four billion people, uh, consumers don't just want the other thing that the other 1.4 billion consumers are, 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 are getting. They want something to make them feel special for them, that's made for them. And you see that from messaging to types of products and, and, and just the formulations that, that brands do very well. The brands that are doing well make those consumers feel like it really serves their need, their interest, their tribe, um, whatever it is. So something that, that we've analyzed, we analyze in, in the skincare tracker is just the messaging that, that brands use and, and just how, how many of them use it and the uh, value they get from that, et cetera. And it's quite interesting the brands, the, the foreign brands, the messaging, the claims that they use are much less personal. Um, so common examples would be lifting, tightening, uh, soothing, anti-aging, those types of things that are quite generic Whereas if you look over at, at what domestic brands are doing, very popular claims terms are much more specific to my needs. So pore shrinking, this is for skincare, uh, anti-acne, oil control, much, much more specific um, as, as a brand uh, and really connecting with consumers and their needs. Uh, foreign brands, most of them still have really great recognition and, and they really trade on that and a lot of consumers still value that, that brand recognition, that international brand recognition. But the, the missed opportunity of not uh, playing to those more specific needs um, is, a, is a real uh, missed opportunity. Now, if we look at, uh, this, is, this is my face, hopefully it's not in the way on your screen, but this is, again, um, the types. This is through our consumer panels that we have for our skincare tracker, and we ask people what are the most important uh, needs for them and for, for products and features and functions, brands, et cetera. And the one that just comes up over every month, um, over and over again, is just suits Chinese skin specifically. And in the past, you could just put a put a foreign brand out there and even have Caucasian models uh, modeling it 
and that would work. But Chinese consumers, uh, I guess, are a lot more confident now and a lot less prepared to settle for just this generic global product and much, much more interested in having a, a product that really is specific for them and uh, is really meets their, them, their needs as a Chinese person. And there's a lot of brands, Chinese brands, that really play well to this, but obviously the premium Japanese brand, uh, which um, Shiseido, who obviously has very similar needs as, as skincare in Japan um, with the Asian skin type, et cetera. Um, they really play on this much more than, than their other big international competitors. So leading up to Singles Day in, in 2020, they really had a big campaign that went out. It was called, by translation, Essential for Asian Skin. And they really, they got a lot of key opinion leaders and, and really hammered home the message, talking about things like Asian uh, people have different lifestyles, different habits, the diets are different. Uh, we have much more oily food. And all this impacts your food, your, your skincare needs and how things should look. Um, the, this, the breasts, uh, less bright skin types, all these things that, that really connected with, with Chinese consumers. And as a result, you, you have done very well. Um, they uh, really connected well with Chinese consumers. Um, and as a, as a country, Japan and Korea, and this is again from our, from our origin, uh, tallies for the consumer panel, Japan and Korea score incredibly highly. For sales volume, they're not as high as France and America and, and other European uh, countries, but from a preference standpoint, they're doing very well. So it's a little harder as a European or a North American or Australasian brand to come in here and, and talk about how you appeal to Chinese skin. Um, but there are some things to, that could be improved from what we've seen a lot of foreign brands, it might be ingredients that are important. That's another thing we track on, on the tracker. Uh, it could be having Asian models, um, which, which uh, obviously um, Caucasian models can also appeal and stand out, but Asian models are, are very important to really show that you're important with, uh, for that, that Asian skin type and lifestyle. Um, so just really something to keep in mind when you're from an NPD standpoint and from a communication standpoint as well. Now, something that, that we've found about Chinese brands that, that is nothing short of inspirational um, is just how quick they move. They talk about Chinese speed um, and, and, and they compare it to, or Chinese years, I should say, they compare it to dog years. What would take seven years in, in most countries would take one year in China. And we were doing a study for one of the big FMCG companies that was quite concerned about how the uh, domestic brands were really taking over a lot of their, um, a lot of their market share. And, and they were really wanted to understand at a deep level, a structural level, what these brands are doing differently. And this would obviously be a whole presentation, but something that, that's quite relevant to this is just how quick to market um, Chinese consumers are, uh, sorry, Chinese brands are. And an example would be um, a face mask or a, a very well-known uh, Chinese uh, beauty brand in Shanghai. And they, from ideation through to selling on shelves, selling online, um, took three days. Um, they're just phenomenally quick at producing these products, even if it's just slight tweaks with different packaging, different positioning. Um, they, can, they can turn things around incredibly quickly. And they have quite a lean startup approach or that throw everything at the wall and see what sticks style of, of operating. Um, and, and as a result, they have many, many more SKUs. And we have a number of, of large international brands that we work with that have about three to four to five times more SKUs in China for the same category in their home markets in Europe and North America. So it's really a case of, again, getting back to that personalization and making sure that cosmetics brands are um, playing to those, those, those tribes, those specific needs, those specific customer segments and demographics, and really making sure that it's relevant to them, um, not just this generic offering. 
Now, I, I'm from New Zealand, you may have noticed from the accent, and growing up in New Zealand and in the mean streets, I, I thought I lived in the center of the world. And then I moved to the Middle Kingdom, um, and I realized really just uh, how small and insignificant our little country is. Um, something that still astonishes me, and I've been here more than 10 years, is just how many cities, and most cities, most people have probably never heard of, are actually bigger than China. And if you take the prefecture level, which is one measurement uh, for a city, there are 109 cities in China with more people than New Zealand. So all these cities, are, uh, well, most of these cities are becoming wealthier, particularly in, in the, the, the bottom half um, by the eastern, eastern seaboard. And, and they're becoming more sophisticated in what they buy. And if you look at a city like Shanghai, it has a population greater than Australia. It has a GDP more than Thailand, more than United Arab Emirates. And it's incredibly wealthy. Um, the purchase power parity in Shanghai is similar to Switzerland. So that city in itself is bigger than markets like the United Arab Emirates, where you'd probably customize just for Dubai, the language, the, the, the marketing strategy, et cetera, some products perhaps. Um, whereas people come to Shanghai, they come to China, and they'll have the same strategy for the same products, the same communications for Beijing, for Shanghai, for Guangzhou, for Shenzhen. And that are tier one cities alone, but you throw in some lower tier cities and you have a whole element of new dimensions. But if you look at a city like Beijing, for example, in the north, it's much more polluted than a city, another tier one city like Guangzhou and Shenzhen down south. And there are, there's a lot of skincare that really plays to pollution. It's probably going to be more relevant in a city like Beijing than a city like, say, Guangzhou. Similarly, it gets incredibly dry there. It's very hot in the summer and dry, very cold and dry in the winter. Whereas down south, uh, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, it's very subtropical. So from a moisturizer, skincare category type thing, it, you're going to have quite different um, needs for consumers. So really worth taking into account, I talk about tribes, I talk about different demographic groups and different skin types, but geography is also another area that where it's really worth considering um, just the diversity of China and just how it is not all just one big market. And really, you can do some pretty uh, interesting things in, in communicating, particularly on digital channels. You can have quite um, geo-targeted communications and similarly for products, et cetera. Um, you can have different landing pages or different advertising, et cetera. So really worth considering um, from, from a um, marketing strategy point of view. Now, um, not long ago, a few weeks ago, there was a, a very, an announcement I've been waiting for for a long time. And that's um, the ability to, for foreign brands to sell cruelty-free or, or not tested on animal cosmetics in China uh, from May the 1st. France was, was very fortunate they've been selling uh, from, from 1st of January. Prior to that, it was only really um, brands that, that are manufactured in China uh, that were allowed this claim. But it's a great, great progress. It's, there's still some things to work out in some countries, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, there's some other areas that, that need to be resolved. Um, but overall, it's, it's a really positive move. There's a lot of brands I know, cruelty-free brands that have been holding out for it and, and probably consider it um, a little bit of a, a the big chance to sell in China. But I think it's really important just to really highlight that it's not going to be a game changer. Um, just coming in and telling everyone you're cruelty-free is not uh, going, to, going to move the dial for a lot of consumers. Uh, as you can see from this, and that, again, this is from our, our consumer panels on, on the skincare tracker, we ask people what, what are the most important uh, criteria for buying these, these products. If you see up the top, tailored to my specific skin type problem, again, that's related to the, uh, the 
the Chinese and also the personalization. Um, so really important to make sure you've cracked that one because it is so vital uh, for consumers. Unfortunately, right down the bottom, just below vegan skincare, um, you've got cruelty-free, no animal testing. That, that is um, what important to Chinese consumers. I think this is going to change. Uh, I think that with hopefully some, some great cruelty-free brands coming in, they'll do some, some really good, strong education around the importance of, of um, cruelty-free and, and, um, and buying with some um, empathy and things. But I, I, right now, it's, it's probably still a little ways away. There are a lot of positive drivers that will, that will help as well. Um, during COVID, um, pets became huge. Pets were already growing quite rapidly, one of the fastest growing categories where, where, from what we watch in China. Um, but with COVID, people got locked in. They couldn't see their friends, uh, colleagues, whoever, but, but they had their dogs or cats, their companions. And they provided comfort, they provided companionship, they provided entertainment in many ways. And as a result, we've seen just the expenditure on pets and things like that just rapidly accelerate and continue to grow, uh, even though people are living relatively normal lives again. And we think that as a proxy, people are more aware of animals and, and have more affection towards animals. So we're hoping that will uh, translate to, to more cruelty-free um, resonance. Um, there is some variation, quite a big variation. And, and again, on the track here, we can, we can look at uh, what, what the differences are between cities, between city tiers, between demographics, et cetera. And if you look at a city like Shanghai, which in many ways is more sophisticated than, than other Chinese cities and will often lead, and other times it doesn't lead. Um, other cities like Chengdu out west can be quite independent and quite different in, in, in many directions. Beijing, again, can be quite different and, and won't follow Shanghai. But overall, a lot of trends in Shanghai uh, will, will slowly trickle down or not so slowly trickle down to, to uh, other parts of China. That's why a lot of the foreign brands will have their R&D centers in, in the city. But Shanghai cruelty-free scores a lot higher. Index is much, much higher. So again, if we're gonna be uh, targeted and specific, Shanghai could be a, a really good city to start in, to selling products. Um, so just to, just to finish, uh, again, my, my email address is there. And if, if you have any questions or want to talk to me, um, I'd love to, love to hear from you. If you're interested in learning more about the trackers, we've got a, a really good detailed description on, on our website at chinaskinny.com slash trackers. And if you do only remember one thing from my presentation, I'd say the most valuable thing would be um, is to go to chinaskinny.com and, and subscribe to our newsletter. It comes out every, every week, every Wednesday, China time. And it, um, it's incredibly well read. A lot of um, people have been with us for many years. Most big brands you've heard of are on there. And it's, it's free. It's a really good way to keep up with not just the beauty category, but just the overall and interconnectedness of, of China as a whole. Um, so I'll leave you on that note, but um, hopefully I think there's a few questions that have come through so I can, I can look at them now. Um, I think we still have, have a little bit of time. So, um, so we all knew Chinese culture is far different. This is from Vicky Ju from the rest of the world. How to do well product communication in China? Whew. That's a very broad question, Vicky, but a good one to ask. I think it's important to note that a lot of brands will come and just communicate the way they communicate in the West. They'll just translate it into, into Chinese and expect that to work. Uh, but hopefully from, from my presentation, um, it's uh, something that's clear is one, it's not one size fits all. It can be quite specific uh, to different cities, different tribes, uh, different needs. And it's really important to make sure you capture that. But I guess overall, it's, it's good to have an umbrella because you can't have, there's so many different cities, 109 more than New Zealand, it's worth having that overarching umbrella and then just having some tweaks by city or by demographic. 
but it's understanding what resonates uh, with Chinese consumers for one, so how to communicate or what to communicate, but also how to communicate. And Chinese consumers absorb information quite differently than uh, consumers in the West. They're much more digitally centric. Um, they'll, they'll go online for an awful lot of information. Um, they go into e-commerce, um, whereas if you look at an Amazon page, for example, there's very little information on an Amazon page. Whereas if you go into a Tmall or a JD page, there's screens and screens of information, um, entertainment, there's videos, tell, um, there's apps that tell you about how to test your skin type and, and recommendations for that all within the e-commerce page. Uh, there's live streaming, there's ways that can scan your skin and, and give you uh, recommendations that way with your phone, all sorts of different um, type things. There's no Instagram, there's no, or well, very little. Um, people sometimes use VPNs, but most people will just, there's no Facebook, there's no Google, um, there's, there's no Amazon. Um, it's all a very unique ecosystem, which uh, people use differently and, and behave differently. In many cases, much more advanced uh, from a digital angle uh, than other, other countries. So important to say what and say how, which channels. Um, Vicky Ju, we've got you again uh, down here. Um, we all, oh, sorry, that's how to take, how to take the route in the Chinese market from Foamy Lee. Um, I'm not sure what that question is, what that question means. I mean, if, maybe if you could ask another question again and, and we, can, um, we can ask that. Um, but in the meantime, um, Daniel um, Moshwain, um, which natural ingredients are mainly imported into China from Africa? That's a good question and I wish I knew off the top of my head, but I unfortunately don't know what, what ingredients are coming from Africa. There are a lot of ingredients coming from Europe and, and whilst Sea Beauty Chinese cosmetics companies are, um, are really going, growing well and, and preference is, is going to a little bit more towards, towards the Sea Beauty every, every month, um, there's still signs that there's still that aspirational and admirational uh, view of, of foreign cosmetics, particularly French. A lot of, a lot of uh, cosmetics companies that are based in China have French names, they have French ingredients and a lot of that type of thing that really indicates just that, that some, and they'll, they'll really claim about their important ingredients or imported manufacturing or overseas manufacturing, et cetera. So it's really important to really understand which, which ingredients are important to your particular target market. Um, we've got a question from uh, Tony Diamond, what is the number one reason a Chinese person would buy a foreign product over a domestic product? Really good question. Uh, the price, innovation, quality, something else. Uh, a lot of it is, is the brand. It's trusted. It's big. Uh, there's quality control um, is, is something that's always foreign brands have had an edge, although that, that is diminishing. Uh, in many cases, price is not um, on average Domestic brands are about two thirds of the price uh, from, from foreign brands. A lot of it's innovation. And again, a lot of these big brands that are doing incredibly well in China, big foreign brands are based on innovation. Um, but overall, it's about one of it, it's status. It's about if you've got a brand that's well known or even niche and under known, but it's cool and has a great um, DNA, it can, it can be very important to consumers and they will they will really uh, lock onto that and, and connect with that. Um, so there's all there's not one factor, um, but some of it's trust, um, some of it is is that innovation, and some of it's just the brand story behind that, uh, and just to feel feel different. So quality is obviously a big one as well. Great. I think that's. Um, is is there any other questions, or uh, is is that? I think that's probably. Okay, thanks, Mark. Thanks for your great input. And if anyone has any questions, you know, we can collect later and uh, we can also connect with Mark on Beauty Sourcing Community. He will have his own group 
on our community and you can also connect with him later after our webinar. Okay, next we over to Apple Guo. Apple, are you there? Mark, I think you need to off your screen share. Yeah, I'll, I'll set that. Thanks, Selena. And thanks, nice, thanks. Uh, thanks. nice webinar. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Hello, Selena. Hello, Apple. Can you yes. share your screen? Yes, I can share you. Let okay, you can start. Can you see it? Yeah. Great. So can I start now? Yes, you can stand up. Okay, thank you, Selena. Uh, first of all, thank both uh, Beauty Sourcing's invitation um, to uh, give the presentation here. Um, as we know, the last year is the special year. Uh, one of the reasons is the pandemic attack of the COVID-19. Um, and the hope is uh, the vaccines will be available globally as soon as possible so that our life will get back to normal. And another reason is the Chinese regulations um, has the big, big changes. So we have, we will have the, yes, this will be the big challenges for all stakeholders. So today's presentation, I will share the, yes, share the, the latest regulations of the, um, in China. And um, yes, so let me, so today's I have, divided my presentation into the four parts. Here are the main, uh, main contents of the latest uh, regulations, including the first is the cosmetic supervision and administration regulations. And the second is the measures for the administration of cosmetics registration and the following. And the third is the provisions on the management of cosmetics registration and the following data. These three regulations are finalized and uh, as we know, another regulation regarding the new cosmetic ingredient is also finalized as well. But uh, given today's time is limited, so I will share the, the I will focus on the cosmetics regulations. And uh, the last part is the latest official announcement on the implementation of provisions on the management of cosmetics registration and the following data. Here. Um, as you can say, the cosmetic supervision and administration regulations on the June, on the 29th of June of last year, the State Council is to the cosmetic supervision and administration regulations. It is shortly before the CSAR took effect this year. And uh, this new regulation replaced the regulations concerning the hygiene supervision of cosmetics, which has been effective for more than 30 years. And uh, there, will, there are the six chapters and 80 articles for this uh, regulation. And here are some of the main contents. Um, first is the type of cosmetics, as we know, According to this new regulation, the cosmetics are divided into the special and ordinary cosmetics. For special cosmetics, they are the hair dye, hair burn, anti freckle, anti whitening, sunscreen, anti hair loss, and uh, cosmetics that clean the new effects. And uh, for others, um, except the uh, uh, special cosmetics, are regarded as the ordinary cosmetics. The second is about the determination of cosmetics classification. It should refer to the cosmetics classification rules and the catalogs. Uh, this regulation is still draft. And um, this regulation is based on the cosmetics efficacy claims, action sites, product dosage forms, users, and usage. Um, the next is, is about the toothpaste. As we know, these kind of products are will be managed as ordinary cosmetics. 
uh, as we know, according to the old regulation, the pre-market registration is not to, uh, needed for the toothpaste, but uh, under the new regulation, it should be managed that as ordinary cosmetics, so the pre-market filing will be mandatory for these kind of products. But for ordinary beauty, soap can be imported without the pre-market filing. But the soaps with the function of special cosmetics have to be registered before the production and import. The cosmetics used for hair growth, hair removal, breast shaping, fatalist the authorization that have been registered before the enforcement of the SAR can be produced, imported, and sold within five years of transition period. Since the 2026, the above cans of cosmetics are not allowed to produce, import it, and sell. And the next is the cosmetics registrant and finders led to be responsible for the cosmetic uh, quality, safety, and efficacy of cosmetics. The summary of the literature research data or product efficacy evaluation data should be regarded as the supporting document of, of efficacy claim, they can be public, uh, they will be published on the NMPA de uh, dedicated website for public uh, search and social supervision. Uh, the government will strengthen the management of packaging materials in direct contact of, uh, of cosme uh, with cosmetics. And uh, the next is very important about is uh, Chinese sticker. It will be um, available for imported. A Chinese sticker should be available for imported cosmetics, but the content of the Chinese label shall be consistent with the, that of the original label. This will be the big challenges. Um, this is under the draft version. We don't know whether the finalized version have the change because this will be give the um, big challenges for the foreign um, foreign enterprises because it will take much more time to design uh, um, design uh, the, the 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 new state uh, new labels for the Chinese market, and uh, as we know, the regulations is different in the different countries. So if uh, if we want to place the market in the Chinese label, we have to comply with the local regulations. So there will be my, the, some of the different versions for the, yes, for your original countries and the Chinese market. And the Chinese sticker has to contain the name and address of a manufacturer and the product implementation standard longer. And the next is about some of the management of new ingredients. This is, I just make the yeah, highlight here in this slide. As we know, the new, new cosmetic ingredients with the high safety risk are subject to re registration management. And uh, the other new cosmetic ingredients are subject to the following management. For the new cosmetic ingredients with the function of the preservative, sunscreen, coloring, hair dye, antifreckle, and whitening are regarded as the ingredient of uh, the high, high risk ingredients. And for this kind of the uh, high risk in new ingredients, the, of the government will issue the registration certificate once approved. And after the registration of filing, within the three years, the, the, um, the annual report should be uh, submitted regarding the use and safety status of the new materials. And the next is about is the post-market surveillance. And um, in the case, if, um, if, um, if, the, if we could, uh, could not submit the report about is, um, for the use and safety status of the new materials, um, the, the enterprise will face the maximum fine of the 500,000 yuan. And if, the, if having the following violations and uh, will result in the punishment of lifetime ban from engaging in the production and operation of cosmetics for the responsible persons of the illegal unit. 
such as the production of cosmetics without a qualified production license, production, marketing, or import of unregistered special cosmetics, addition of banded or new cosmetic ingredients in cosmetics production, and addition of the substances that may endanger human health or use of cosmetics or cosmetic raw materials that have expired or been discarded or recycled in cosmetics production, or if pro uh, providing the false information or adoption, adopting other deceptive means when applying for an administrative license of cosmetics. So these are some main contents about the CSAR and the lax regulations. Um, I will introduce the, yeah, some of the main contents about the measures for the administration of cosmetics registration and filing. This regulation was issued on the 7th of January of this year and uh, will effective on the 1st of May of this year. Here is about the qualification of cosmetics registrant and the finder. It is, it, is, um, the, it is an enterprise or other organization established according to the law. And uh, more importantly, the, this, uh, the registrant or finder should have a quality management system suitable for the cosmetics to, to be registered and filed. And so this is the, yes, this is the big challenges for some of the registrants. They are, they could not have their own manufacturer. And um, the studies should have uh, an ability of adverse reaction monitoring and evaluation. Here are the general requirements for the duty of the domestic responsible person. There will be the five, the yes, five parts. The first is the, the dom domestic response person should register and file the cosmetics or new cosmetic ingredients in the lane of the registrant and the finder. And the, they also should assist the registrants or finders in the monitoring of cosmetics adverse reaction, safety monitoring, and the reporting of new cosmetic ingredients. And they also should assist the uh, registrants and finders in the record of the cosmetics and uh, cosmetic ingredients. According to the agreement between the responsible person and the registrant or finder, they should undertake the corresponding safety and quality responsibilities of cosmetics and the new cosmetic ingredients placed in the Chinese market. Last is the domestic responsible person should cooperate with the separation and inspection work of the competent authority. And these are the important changes, as you can see. Um, the first two is our, our uh, two points are available for both the ordinary and the special cosmetics. They are the first is the raw material requirements, as you can see. The source and the safety related information of raw materials are required for the registration and the filing of cosmetics. And the second is the product implementation standard. This is the new requirements uh, under the new regulation. And uh, yes, this is also required for when, when doing the registration and filing work. The, yes, the remaining is for the ordinary cosmetics, special cosmetics, and the new cosmetic ingredients. For ordinary cosmetics, we have to submit the annual report for the um, we got for the filed cosmetics. Uh, please note this is only available for the ordinary cosmetics. Um, this the annual report will uh, contain the production, importation information and whether complying with the Chinese regulations and standards. And for special cosmetics, um, there will be three differences. Uh, three differences. Uh, the first is the domestic will some sort of person, as you know, compared with the old regulations. The domestic response person, the, as you can see the duties I have mentioned in the previous slides, and uh, so this is the big changes. 
because under the current uh, rec, uh, policy, the responsible person for the special cosmetics is only in charge of the product registration. But for the new policy, uh, as you can see, they will have other duties. And the license will, um, will be valid for five years. Currently, uh, the license is valid for four years. And another uh, change is we have to upload the sales package to the online platform after the registration, because um, uh, currently this is an, um, no need to upload the sales package to this online system. And for the new customer ingredient, as you can see, um, if there is the change of the use purpose or the safe limit, we have to perform the new registration of filing work. And uh, there will be the three years of the safe monitoring period after the registration and the filing, since the date when the cosmetics using the approved or filed new ingredient for the first time have been registered or filed. So this is also the new requirements for the management of the new ingredient after the registration and the filing. And this process shows the filing process of the imported the new custom ingredient with the low safety risk. I just want to say um, this process for the, for the new ingredient with the low risk is the similar as the filing of the ordinary cosmetics. The first step is over for the overseas finder, they have to authorize the domestic responsible person for the ID application to the registration and the filing information system. And uh, then we have to prepare the filing materials to submit to the NMPA for uh, which means once, uh, once submitted, which means the filing work is compli uh, completed. And within five days after the filing materials, um, the government will take the official uh, format review. If there's no comments, the information management department will disclose the relevant information of the final and the domestic responsible person and the basic information of the mo raw materials. So please know that for the registration of the new ingredients with the high risk, um, the registration license will be issued after passing both the format and technical review. So the review process is the almost the same for um, as the current to the policy. The big change is just for the filing um, of the new ingredients with the low risk. So how to use the registered and file the new ingredients? So there will be the two stages. The first is the raising the safety monitoring period of three years. Um, for example, for the registrant and the final A of the new ingredient, they can use the new ingredient directly to, to produce the cosmetics. Or they can also rise to the registrant and the final B of cosmetics to use this new ingredient. But another company um, if they are the registrant or finder C, they have not been authorized by the, by the company A. They have to perform the new customer ingredient registration or filing before use these ingredients to the cosmetics. And another stage is out of the period of safety monitoring. Um, the NMPA will organize an evaluation of new, uh, new raw materials that have been safety uh, monitored for three years. If there is no safety issue, the registered or filed raw materials will be included in the ICC. And uh, for the monitoring of the, um, the same new materials that is still in the monitoring period, the, the monitoring um, work will be determined, uh, will be uh, canceled simultaneously. And uh, if there is the safety issue, the registration and the filing of the raw materials and the cosmetics using this raw material will be canceled as well. And uh, let's move on to the next uh, regulation is the per uh, uh, about to the cosmetics registration of filing data requirements. And uh, 
as you can see from this table, it shows the dose requirements for the ID application. Because as you know, this is the first step for the following work. And uh, compared with the current uh, policy, um, the dose requirements has the big changes and the, 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 the challenges also a big challenges as well. As you can say, there will be some, the seven, um, there will be uh, seven parts of the dose requirements. The first information sheet of the registrant and the finder and the room of quality and the safety person. As you can say, the item uh, marked as the red is the new requirements compared with the current policy. The second is the overview of quality management system of registrant and the finder. And the third is the overview of adverse reaction monitoring and evaluation system of registrant and the finder. And the third is the information sheet of domestic response person. This is just required for the overseas registrant and the finder. And the last is the original and the notarized of power of attorney. And the last is the information sheet of a manufacturer and information of the quality and the safety responsible person. The last is the original and the notarized copy of ISO or GMP certificate. So here are the food dosers requirements for the ID application. As you can see, um, if you act the different roles, the dose requirements will be different. But uh, if you will apply for the overseas registering to finder or to be the domestic with some other person, normally the, yes, or the seven, um, seven uh, uh, items will be required. And here is some of the clarification for the overview of quality management system of registrant and finder. It is the summary description of quality management control capabilities and the process of registrants and finders to reflect the actual situation in a true and objective way, such as the management system of supply selection, selection raw material acceptance, production process, and quality control, sample retention, and so on. It should reflect uh, the setting of the key points of the quality control and daily implementation management requirements. For the overview of adverse reaction monitoring and the evaluation system of registrant and the finder, it is the summary description of adverse reaction monitoring and evaluation capabilities and process of registrant and finder and the domestic responsible person. Um, as you can see here is the sample of the overview of quality management system for the independent the production. Uh, from this table, as you can see, there will cons it consists of the 10 parts. There are the personnel health management, quality management system, such as the document management, testing system, trace management, supplier selection, material acceptance, equipment, production process, and the quality control. And the last is though about the records management, basic information of workshop, equipment use and maintenance, production water, qualified to release, retention sample management, self-check and error correction of quality. Last is the others. And this table is for the overview of quality management system for subcontractor production. It, as you can see, it consists of the seven parts. They are the source of the formula, material uh, procurement, production enterprise selection and management system, product release, quality management measures independent from the production enterprise, the shelf check and error correction of quality and others.
And uh, this is the sample of the overview of the address, uh, address reaction monitoring and the evaluation system. It is for the overseas registrant and the finder. As you can see, it, um, it mainly consists of the three parts. Uh, but the first two parts, the content is almost the similar. Uh, they are the first part is just for the registrant and the finder. The second part is for the domestic response person. So um, the content should include the job responsibility, adverse reaction monitoring, like the constitution, the running mode, channels, and the frequency of information collection. And uh, for the adverse reaction evaluation, it should come uh, uh, include the standard, the treatment measures. And the third part is about the communication mechanism between the registrant and the finder and the domestic responsible person. Here are the important notes for the ID application. So first is the, we have to, uh, normally um, the, gov uh, the regulation will request it to fill in the information of all manufacturers one time. And uh, if being the multiple identities, such as domestic registrant or finder, domestic responsible person and the manufacturer, the required doc documents can be submitted one time. And if the registrant or finder produced the cosmetics by both its own plant and the contract manufacturer, the two versions of the overview are for the quality management system of registrant and finder are required. For the overseas ISO or GMP certificate with the valid period, the updated version should be submitted within 90 days after the expiration date. If there is no valid period, the latest version should be submitted every five years. This slide shows the food dosers requirements of the cosmetics registration and the filing. Um, as you can see, it consists of the registration of filing information sheet and the related documents, nomenclature of product lane and the product formula, product implementation standard, sample label of product, testing report, the product safety evaluation data. So the following slides, I will clarify the, the yes, some of the, some parts, especially they have the different the requirements compared with the current policy. For the first part, the registration of file information sheet and the related document. This part will include the product name, the classifica uh, classification code, and the certificate of free sale. For the third part, the product formula, this will have the contain the very important information. We have to provide the ingredient supplier information and this uh, information related to this uh, quality and safety file or the code of the all ingredients. So how to submit the safety related information? Normally there will be the two options. The first is maybe the, um, the co cosmetic registrant or finder or the domestic responsible person upload the quality and safety information file provided by the ingredient supplier directly. But uh, this, uh, for this option normally, um, the, I think the, uh, one of the concern is the, um, the confidential information will be disclosed. So normally the ingredient supplier, supplier will um, prefer the second option. The ingredient manufacturer will submit the uh, quality and the safety information uh, of the cosmetic ingredients to the government specific, uh, to the NMPA specified information system to issue a code of the raw material. And the, then the cosmetic registrant or finder or the domestic responsible person will fill in the code to affiliate the quality and the safety information file. So this uh, chart shows the 
how to yes submit the yes the safety related information. There will be the two steps. One is the ID application file the safety information service the platform. Uh, we should provide this uh, uh, record information sheet of the cosmetic ingredient manufacturer. And uh, also we should uh, submit the documentary evidence as an entity of the enterprise, such as the business license. Um, and the second uh, step is we should fill in the quality and the safety related information to the online system. As you can see, it shows the main parts of the, yes, this uh, uh, information related to the quality and the safety of the cosmetic ingredient. It covers the treat length, the composition of the ingredient, recommended amount of addition in cosmetics, the use restrictions of raw material, uh, char characters of raw material, this description of physical and chemical properties, description of production process, quality control requirements, evaluation conclusion of international authoritative body, the use requirements in other countries, limits of risk substances, and so on. So it, this is looks more complicated, and uh, there will be the Yes, big burden for the ingredient supplier if they want to if they sell the cosmetic ingredient to the uh, to their customers and is using these ingredients uh, in China. And the next is the product implementation standard. It should uh, contain the product formula, production process, sensory index microbiological index, physical chemical index, instruction, storage condition, shelf life, and so on. Uh, the next is about the sample of the product, sample label of the product. This is also the new ingredient because currently we will submit some, yes, the, the like is a paper um, compiled the content of the Chinese label. But for the new regulation, so yes, this is the specific template uh, provided by the government. And we should fill in the, this sample label information to the online system, and we should upload the sales package. And here is the sample uh, of this uh, sample label to submit for your reference. As you can see, um, it uh, contains of the 14 parts uh, should be um, filled to the online system. They are the product lane, registration number of special cosmetics, the name and address of registering of finder, and the name and address of domestic responsible person, and the name and address of a manufacturer, production license number, um, normally, production license number is uh, normally we, uh, this is required for the local manufacturer, and uh, uh, product implementation standard number, labeling of all ingredients. There will be the uh, two parts. One is the ingredients with more than zero point one percent, and the others uh, are the tracing are uh, the trace ingredients less than the zero point one percent. So this is the completely, completely new in uh, new requirements for the labeling. And the next is the lab rate, shelf life instruction, warning words, clarification of product lane, explanation of innovative terms, and uh, whether the uh, whether labeling like like the words is have been has been evaluated and uh, verified. Normally, this is um, based on if the uh, according to the draft version is um, if the efficacy evaluation um, uh, was performed uh, uh, under the human uh, human evaluation, we we can labels uh, like these words have been ev ev evaluated and uh, verified. But uh, for other types of the 
uh, if fixed evaluation we could not label by this way. But we don't know how, um, how, uh, whether it has to change for the follow nice version. And uh, after special claims and other copywriting contents. And uh, yes, this is, uh, yes, about the testing reports. As we know, um, it consists of the microbiology test, physical test, toxicity test, human safety, and human efficacy test. And uh, for this part, as we know, most of the concern is about the animal testing. According to the current uh, policy, the animal testing is mandatory for the toxicological test. But uh, the, the good news is under the new regulation, so, um, yes, uh, the government opened the door for the, um, for the raving of the animal testing, but there will be the, some of the raving conditions, and this is only available for the ordinary cosmetics. So as you can see, there are the two raving conditions. One is we have two uh, suppliers, supplies the official qualification, certification of production quality management system, which means um, we have to provide the official ISO or GMP certificate. Or normally, as we know, some of the yes, countries, uh, this kind of document is issued by the third party company. The government does not involve in this work. So it is difficult for most of the, yes, uh, foreign companies to get this official document. As we know, uh, recently, uh, the French government take the, some actions to uh, issue the official GMP certificate. And the second is the, about the safety risk assessment. Um, as long as the, this evaluation results can fully confirm the product safety. So another important note is if um, if the if there are some multiple manufacturers, the animal testing can be exempt based on having the official qualification certification of production quality management system of all manufacturers. So this is very important to be noted. And here are some exceptions. As you can see, um, the animal testing can be raped for the baby, uh, cannot be raped for the baby or children care products. And if the products contains a new approval or filed new ingredients within the period of the uh, supervision, and according to the quantitative grading results, the final domestic resource person or manufacturer is listed as, the, as a key regulatory object. And uh, here are some of the, uh, of the key points to be concerned for the, uh, yes, for the, some of the changes. And uh, first of all, as you can say, if the, um, if there is the change or uh, of the production site, or if increase the production site, um, for the filed ordinary cosmetics based on using the safety evaluation report to waive the animal testing, in case the local government could not issue the official qualification certificate of the yes production quality management system, the toxicity test can be waived. So this is what I mentioned in the previous slide. And another is um, if changes or increased ingredient supplier or specifications, um, there are the two different uh, uh, conditions to uh, concern. First is the, if the content of the ingredient in the formula is no change, and the type of the specific components in the ingredient is low change. And uh, also the proportion of the specific components in the ingredient is no change. We just don't need to update the ingredient supplier or the safety related information of the ingredient. Or if related, we should change the safety evaluation report. Nevertheless, if the 
content of the ingredient in the formula means no change. The content of the main composition in the ingredients and its solvent is no change. But there is the change of the type or content of trace, st uh, trace stabilizer, antioxidant, or preservative. We have to revise the product formula and the safety evaluation report. And if related, we have to update the, update the implementation standard and the sample label. And the last is about for the amendments of the uh, amendments of the implementation standards. As you can see, um, if there is the change of the description of the production process, we have to provide this uh, new microbiological and the physicochemical testing report. And if there are some changes of the instructions, we have to revise the safety evaluation data and. Uh, if the yes, if the shelf life is uh, will be extended, we have to provide this uh, stability research data. And uh, yes, the last but not least is if there is the if we have to change the domestic responsible person, we have to provide the product list, and the informed consent stamped by the old responsible person to the to change the responsible person or effective judgment documents to prove the change of responsible person or the letter of commitment for the new responsible person to bear the responsibilities of products and assets related with the responsible person. The last but not least is the part about the official announcement regarding some, yes, normally it's a transition period for the management of the cosmetics and, uh, and uh, new and uh, cosmetic ingredients. As you can say, um, as you can say, this official announcement was issued on the 5th of March. And um, here are some of the different, uh, uh, the timeline. Since the, yes, tomorrow, as you can see, the ID application will be available on the new online system of the cosmetics registration and the filing. And since May, the cosmetics registration and filing application will be available on the new online system. For the, yes, the old online system will be closed for the new application of the cosmetics registration and the filing. Since the, yes, since since last year, for all ordinary cosmetics filed on both the old and the new online system, the annual report will be required from the 1st of the January to the 31st of March of each year. Before the May of next, uh, next year, for all cosmetics registered or filed on the old online system, we have to provide this uh, product implementation standard and the sample label. Product uh, for domestic ordinary cosmetics, we have to submit the product formula. And for special cosmetics, we have to submit the pictures of the sales packaging. And uh, last but not least is, the, is about uh, for the management of the cosmetic ingredient requirements. As you can see, since, the, uh, since May, the, we have to Submit the source and the trade line of the ingredients in the formula and the certificate of analysis or safety related information of specific ingredients required on the safety and the technical standards for cosmetics and the 20 and 20 and 15 version. Uh, compared with the current policy. Uh, we have to submit the certifi uh, certificate of analysis of the specific ingredients. So the new work is to provide this uh, um, source and the trade line of the ingredient in the formula since the May of this year. And uh, since last year, we have to submit this uh, safety related information of the ingredients with the function of preservative sunscreen, colorant, hair dye, anti and vitamin. And uh, since the 2023, 
we have to submit the safety related information of all ingredients in the formula. And the next is the efficacy evaluation test of special cosmetics. As you can see, since the last year, uh, the human efficacy trial will be required for the registration of cosmetics for anti fracco uh, whitening, and anti hair loss. And uh, since the May of last year, uh, we will submit this uh, human efficacy trial report of cosmetics for anti fracco whitening and uh, anti hair loss, which have been registered since the uh, 1st of May of this year to the end of this year. So that's more of my presentation. Thank you for your time. So if you have any questions after the presentation and you can send me the email for your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Apple. Thanks for your great presentation. Just please stay with us. We will leave all the questions after all the presentations. Okay, next we over to Teresa, the founder of Moment Z. Teresa, are you here? Apple, you need to okay. close your yeah, screen shut. Okay. Hello. Hello, Apple. Are you hello? Hello, Teresa. Are you here? Yes, I'm here. Hey, we cannot see you. Uh wait a second. Can you see the oh. Yeah, I can see the screen. Okay. Okay, yeah. I was hmm. So hello everyone, this is Moment Z from Beijing and we um, define ourselves as Generation Z Queen Beauty. And uh, a brief introduction, Moment Z stands for Glowing Moments and Z stands for Gen Z, that's uh, the story of our name. Um, I and a co-founder became friends when we attended high school in Boston. Um, and after high school, I went to Brown. She went up to Duke. We kept in touch uh, and we traveled together every summer, did yoga together, developed a common interest in beauty and well-being and wrote, we also wrote a blog together. Um, because our interest in beauty, health and well-being, we believe that ideal beauty shouldn't be just about fair and smooth skin. Um, but more importantly, about the vitality and confidence that comes from healthy glowing skin. And that is what we want our brand to communicate to our customers. So um, most importantly, who is Gen Z and why are they important? Um, so we define ourselves as Gen Z Queen Beauty. Uh, first of all, I want to define Gen Z more clearly. Gen Z are customers who are born after the 90, in 1990s, according to Billy Billy, um, Gen Z's favorite online platform. So for cosmetics, most of them are between age of 16 to 30. In 2020, Gen Z consumers have uh, taken up more than 50% of online, sell online sales in beauty industry. And look at uh, some data here I showed in the PowerPoint. We find them the following traits. Firstly, they pursue healthy skin because they have more uh, self-awareness and focus on self-need. They value the safety of the products very much. Um, the second trait is that they prefer products of high potency. According to our own customer research, we have about 75% of Generation Z customers and 17% of them are university students. This means that Gen Z are well educated enough to distinguish high potency ingredients and the science behind the products. As the data show, also shows, the younger generations search for high potency ingredients and have great interest in cosmeceuticals. The last trait is also very important, and I believe many Chinese brands have missed this point. Gen Z crowd attend to self-care. On one hand, as I mentioned above, they value safety and potency. But on the other hand, this also means that they want to choose the unique brand that can convey their own values. So both of us live in the US for seven years and we are influenced by the more uh, mature consumer market, I would say in the US. Brands stand out because of their brand values and it plays um, important roles in consumers' buyer decision. Like for example, if I want to buy a sports 
sneakers, I will go to Nike, Adidas, or anywhere, and I find all the shoes are probably the same. Um, so I will probably buy an uh, Oberts because it has its um, environmental protection value behind it. So this is a very important buyer decision, I think, in the Western and more mature uh, consumer market. So uh, we have this new group of customers, but they can only choose from brands like Lancome or SkinCeuticals with good brands image, some high potent products, but very expensive. Or they can choose from brands sells in Western, cheap, but without brand values. So this is a great gap and opportunities for brands to come in the middle. Um, so what does Gen Z want in cosmetics? Um, that's our three most important parts within Gen Z values. So first is the superfood ingredients. Uh, they are closely connected, actually, the superfood, the high potent, and Gen Z. For superfood ingredients, I mean the um, superfood for Gen Z, now like ginseng, goji berry, these are for like last generations, but more um, like a superfood like a caffeine or a CBD or um, pro probiotics. Um, high potency is also clearly connect with superfood ingredients for Gen Z. And I mentioned Gen Z here again is to point out that we need to communicate and advertise in their own way, align with their own value. So Chinese cosmetic market is growing rapidly and the market of cosmeceuticals demonstrate a higher growth opportunity than the rest of the mar beauty market. The projected annual growth rate is about 25%. So here I would like to mention SkinCeuticals growth in China. They um, double and triple their uh, GMV in the past two years. So it is known for its high potency formula and has recently became the best-selling skincare brands on Timo this year. So it proves that the market's uh, demands for high potency products um, and also for high potency brands. I will expand a little uh, in high potency. So when we were picking uh, the right entry point to the Gen Z market, we draw a pyramid as shown in the PPT uh, of skin care products people use at home. The pyramid is divided into, uh, I would say two or three parts, the weekly products on the top and the daily products on the bottom. For um, weekly products, they are more potent, but by definition, less frequently used by the customers. Like acid pads or porn strips, you don't use them every day, but the result can be seen easily. For daily products, they can be used every day, but you don't really see a much difference. So like serum, cleanser, moisturizer. Uh, the strategy is to pick the category that is not only high potent, so we can establish a brand, brand image of functional cosmeceutical brand, but also can be used more frequently so that people want to repurchase. So that's our logic, so we pick uh, the middle session, the rescue masks and the boosters are our uh, main products. Mm, then it's about how to market to them. Um, I will skip the marketing side because all Chinese friends are very, very good at operation and marketing. They either have capitals or they have positions. Marketing in Chinese social media platform is rather um, versatile, I would say, and requires rapid reaction for daily changes. So I don't think foreign brands can exceed Chinese brand in this way, unless you find a very, really professional operation company to help you. However, the branding part is almost missing in all Chinese brands. I think this might be a chance for foreign brands to enter. I mentioned that we have three campaigns last year. And, uh, and these campaigns prove that Gen Z consumers love to pay for branding, and this can be added on to the brand in the long run. Mm, this, so we did these three campaigns show on the right. This series of campaigns started in June last year with our new CBD products. The main marketing point of the product is renewing of the skin. Thus, the theme of these campaigns um, 
its renovation of the self. In other, in other words, we want to raise self-consciousness in the generation Z. This is the first, uh, so this, this is our first and the shortest content and the one without Chinese narration. Um, I don't know whether I should play it because I think the internet maybe you won't allow me to do that. But if you are interested, you can uh, look into this one. Uh, basically, the video portrays the reborn of the girl in metaphor of renewing of the skin. Um, it's in a very avant-garde visual style. And this visual style perfect uh, is a perfect demonstration of the uh, this ingredient CBD. It's only legalized in 2017, but it might be not legalized in the future. It, there is a risk. So we were unsure about Gen Z before launching the content. We don't know whether they are ready, um, whether they can understand what we want to convey, or even whether they are patient enough to finish the content. It was a very bold move, but result was very encouraging. Um, so I showed the result on the PowerPoint. So weekly views on Weibo uh, surpassed one, um, one million. So after our first campaign, many people rush in to share their own reborn story with us. We see um, lack of confidence with body diversity, struggle with social expectations or sexuality. So the second campaign, we chose to do some real life stories. We cooperated with an influencer to symbolize this anxiety. And the third campaign, I think, is the most remarkable among the three, uh, with a very sensitive topics on LGBTQ. This community is growing in Generation Z, but this is almost like a taboo in Chinese social media. No brands, no social entrepreneurs tend to say anything about this community. So we actually started to marketing in this community early in June last year, and we found this community is growing, and they are very close. We think it is worthy for us to try another bold move. So we invited three of our customers who are also the key opinion leaders uh, in this community to share their different stories. So this content is a 10 minute video. It's a rather, rather long uh, content. So we wanted to do something more profound, more in depth to move the Generation Z and to deliver on core values and also to test um, how much they can afford and how ready they are for the branding uh, market. Um, and the result is again, very inspiring. We receive a lot of encouraging comments and incredible results. Um, the views surpassed 2 million on Weibo and we are the top 12 on Weibo beauty fashion content. Um, uh, so we think Generation Z in China is totally ready for uh, this and they're just waiting for brands that can convey their own values to come out. I think more and more Chinese brands will realize this, but they will really hesitate because this cannot bring them the highest and fastest growth. However, I think um, this situation gives us the chance to grow brand, uh, brand awareness. I think branding is the advantage of our team and it's also advantage for more foreign brands. Um, so to establish a brand with content value and community uh, in order to uh, create brand value, I think it's rather important because they, this will enable us to create better products. And in the long run, this will be an upro, upward spiral for us. So this is one of our hero products we branded about in the last three campaigns. It has the highest uh, return of investment uh, among our all products. Again, as I mentioned, the three important features about Gen Z Cream Beauty, this product has its very Gen Z superfood ingredient, CBD. It is high potent. Um, and on the left side, the, uh, there are some comments from the customers. This product was distributed as samples in the first and many come back to repurchase because of its high potency. Um, Although I talk a lot about gaining long-term values from branding, actually our campaigns have brought us visible growth. It increased our conversion to sell percentage tremendously. Last year, uh, the conversion rate of our single day sale, um, which is like the Black Friday sale uh, in China, uh, doubled. 
Okay, let's look at the customer portraits. A very interesting fact is the gender. So Gen Z male customer is growing very fast in Tmall. They are only 30% male customer in the entire uh, Tmall beauty section, which include many men's brands. So this is a great potential for um, male con con consumer products in the beauty industry. Before the LGBTQ campaign, we had about five to eight percent of male customers, but this number rose to fifteen after this campaign. Um, uh, and on the right side is our ranking. Uh, so for this Generation Z customers, we are um, uh, in in terms of age, more than seventy five percent of our customers are from Generation Z. Um, and they all come from the first tier cities and new, or the new first tier cities. Um, this is rather interesting because our um, our price is around 150. This is a rather high price in Chinese beauty industry. So most of customers are from the more premium cities. Um, again, they have the strongest needs for clean beauty and they are educated enough for high potency products and super full ingredients. Um, they want to have brands to stand for their own values and they are uh, the most willing to pay for the price as well. So um, that's uh, all about our uh, Gen Z market and how we market in Gen Z market. Thank you. Hey. Okay, Teresa, thanks for your great uh, presentation. Very nice product. Please stay with us and uh, we will have questions later. Okay, our last presenter here is Mira. Mira, are you there? Hi, Selena. Hi, I'm here. Hello. Okay, your turn. Hello. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, thanks everyone for attending the webinar and thanks uh, Beauty First Thing for inviting me. So today my topic will be about uh, the next trends in Chinese Gen Z consumers and how is the effective way to approach them. Um, first, let me just briefly introduce what we do. So I'm Miro, I'm the founder of Double V Consulting. We are a consulting agency specialized in Gen Z marketing. And what we do is we help overseas brands to enter the China market. We provide uh, brand and comp competitor analysis, market entry strategies, um, e-commerce setup operation, and social and digital marketing. And uh, we also have another, um, another uh, China Bowl Academy, which is an online training and resources sharing platform. So we have a lot of online course um, reports, and we also have webinars like what beauty sourcing is doing. So we are also providing a lot of um, content about China market, uh, not only for beauty brands, but for any overseas brands who want to learn about what is going on in China. So yeah, this is what we do. And today uh, my topic is about um, Gen Z marketing. So first, I guess we should understand why Gen Z. Um, first, I think, uh, this is because Gen Z has become the main force of beauty consumers in China. So you can see from uh, the figures, um, Gen Zers has become like they had they they are the majority uh, in terms of the consumers of skincare products. And um, the age when they started from the when they started to use skincare products are becoming much much younger. You can see from this figure. Um, some of the Gen Zers, they started to use skincare products even when they are uh, like 12 to 15 years old. This is very young. Uh, like, because I think for maybe post 80s or post 90s generation, uh, maybe I think most of them start to use skincare uh, in college. But for Gen Zers, like post 95s or post um, 2000s, they start to use skincare products even younger. So I think this is another trend that beauty brands should pay attention to. And next you can see, um, even though they are very young, they still have the purchasing power. So over 37% of the Gen Zers, which is post 95 female consumers, 
they would spend more than 3,000 RMB per year on the cosmetics products. I think this is a lot for Gen Zers, for you know, the young uh, consumers who doesn't have any, any income, but they would be willing to spend a lot on the cosmetics products. And you have over 16% who are willing to spend more than 5,000 RMB per year on cosmetics. I think this is also um, a, a great opportunity for uh, the beauty brand. And so after we understand that Gen Zers have become the main consumers of beauty products, then we need to understand their consumer behavior. So what do they care the most when they are making purchase decision? Over 94% of Gen Zers, they would do research before they purchase any skincare products. And in terms of the factors affecting their decision making, the first one is the product efficacy. So they would um, they would want to learn like uh, what is the efficacy of these skincare products before they purchase. And the second most important factor is the ingredients. So they want to know if the ingredients are safe for their skin. So I think uh, this is also why, um, like uh, last speaker Teresa mentioned, uh, the clean beauty and maybe natural ingredients are very popular in China now. And the third factor is if the products are suitable for themselves. So uh, if it's suitable for their age or maybe their skin type. So this is what they would want to know before they make decision. And uh, when we also uh, look at the subcategories of the skincare products, uh, we compare them uh, in terms of the sales volume, uh, online sales volume. So we find out that uh, sheet mask, skincare set, and liquid essence, these are top three subcategories among the Gen Z consumers. So I guess um, this is also something uh, brands would want to know uh, uh, that you can, you know, implement in your research and development. So after we understand the Gen Z consumers and their uh, purchasing behavior, um, next I will be talk. I will be talking about how to reach them. So today I would focus on two social platforms. The first one is Xiao Hongshu, which is also called Little Red Book or Red. Um, I think maybe most of you have heard of this platform before. So this is a social commerce app, which means it's a combination of social media and e-commerce. So it has a social community and it also has an e-commerce function. So uh, for those uh, who haven't heard of this app or who haven't used this app, um, I think you can imagine it as uh, maybe a combination of Instagram plus Taobao. So for Instagram, you can, you know, post uh, content, you can read other people's posts, you can also like or comment on other people's posts. And uh, for Taobao, you can you know, purchase products. So for Xiaohongshu or Little Red Book, this is actually a combination of both social media and e-commerce. And uh, I want to highlight that I think the social part, uh, the social community is the core value of the platform because it's a uh, very, it's a highly content-driven sharing community. Over 70% of the content are UGC content, which is user-generated content. So which means that the users on Red, they love to, you know, they love to express themselves. They love to post about their daily life. They love to take pictures, shoot videos, and post on Little Red Book. I think this is a, a unique thing about this app. And another thing that's more related to beauty brands is that 90% of the users are female users. So which is, which is why all female related content or products are super popular on this platform, like beauty. Beauty is the number one category on Xiaohongshu. And you also see like fashion, um, lifestyle, uh, food and beverage, this kind of, or even travel, this kind of, contents are uh, also very popular on Red. Um, and the last thing is that uh, Little Red Book, the company, is also jointly invested by the China Internet Unicorns, Alibaba and Tencent. So I think um, if you are a foreign beauty brand, if you want to enter China, I think um, Red would definitely be uh, a platform that you can get. So I think this is uh, 
uh, very basic social platforms for beauty for any beauty brand if you want to sell in China. So next, this is some basic figures about the app. So now it has in total 300 million registered users and over 100 monthly active users. 90% of them are female and over half are post 90s, which is uh, the young generation. And you can see there are already a lot of brands uh, registered on the platform and a lot of uh, third party shops. So for example, shows e-commerce, um, they have their own self-operated store and they also allow brands to uh, open third party shops, which is a bit similar to what Timo is doing. So um, for brands, for foreign brands, if you want to open shops on Sanhongshu, it's uh, actually not very complicated. You can just use your foreign entity to open the cross-border shop and the platform actually can support all the cross-border payments and cross-border logistics. They also have uh, overseas warehouse, so you can just put stock in the warehouse and they will be handle all the um, custom clearance, last mile delivery, uh, tags, everything. So it's, um, it's, it's very easy for a foreign brand to start selling uh, on Xiaohongshu. Um, and how can brands use Xiaohongshu? So because like I said, uh, I think the social community Social community is the core value of the app. So I will be talking more about uh, how you can use the platform to build your um, your your um, brand presence, the social presence uh, on the red book. So besides, you can open a red store. You can also, I think, the first step is to have an official account. So it's also the same. Uh, you can just use your foreign entity to register an official account. And I think this is um, the first step that you need to do. So after you have this account, you can just post uh, all the contents about your brand, just like any other account. You can post images, text, uh, or short videos. You can also launch online campaigns. So this is um, what I would suggest you to do. Um, regularly launch the online campaigns to engage with your customers because um, the customer engagement are very important on the platform because there are too many brands now are doing marketing here so you have to be uh, engaged with your customers so that they would you know remember your brand especially if you are a new brand if you um, don't have a lot of uh, presence in the market yet so online campaigns, you can send out free gifts, you can have lucky draw games, you can ask people to, uh, you can send out free trials, ask people to try your products first, and then maybe ask them to post their feedbacks or uh, their user experience on, 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 on the app. So this is something you can do to engage with your customers. And next, you can also uh, work with uh, Xiaohong Shu to have some advertisements, so they would allow you to you, you to have CPC app, which is uh, um, uh, pay by pay by click or CPM ads, and you can also um, have live streaming. You can also host your own live streaming, or you can work with KOLs to ask them to include your products in their live streaming. This is uh, what uh, brands usually do, and working with the KOLs are. Um, the most common way for a brand to do marketing on Little Red Book. So um, you can ask the KOLs to add the product links, but the links can only be uh, linked to your Little Red Book store, which means you can't add external links because it will be blocked by the app. So you can uh, only link it to your Red store. So you can ask the KOLs to um, like share your products in their posts. Um, there are all kinds of content that they can do. Um, they can uh, take pictures, they can introduce it in their videos, and they can also add like hashtags, uh, mention your brand names, add your uh, shop links, product links in their posts. So this is um, a very common way for you to work with the KOLs. And when you are selecting the KOLs, well, you know, there are different levels of the KOLs on the platform. You have big ones, uh, mid-tier ones, small ones, or even 
micro ones or even KOCs. So when you're selecting KOLs, I think it's it's a it's a uh, an important step for uh, brands to do. You have to investigate their content. If the content can really match your brand image, you have to really uh, look into the comments to see if the followers are you know real followers or if they have too many fake followers. So this is a big question for uh, for a brand. So so because today time is limited, so I would I won't go deeper on this. So I will just um, talk, give you um, maybe a case study first. So I first case study. Um, so I, I think that if any brand wants to uh, launch campaigns or wants to build social presence on literal book, I think you should. Um, take a look at what Perfect Diary is doing, what kind of content they are work they are uh, producing, and what uh, KOLs they are working with. So for them, um, this is a very new brand, but also very successful. So they have been on Xiaohongshu since they just launched the brand. So uh, they have put a lot of resources um, on this platform. So what they do is they have an official account. They also have their own uh, red store. They have all kinds of campaigns. Uh, I think they they have like uh, user engagement campaigns maybe once a week. They have all kinds of free trials um, sent out, free gifts, lucky draws, everything they they would use to engage with their followers. They also do live streaming like maybe every day. Uh, both on Red and also on Timo and on all the platforms that they are selling. So they are very aggressive here. So when they are working with the uh, KOLs, I, I want to highlight is that first is how they choose the KOLs, uh, what kind of KOLs they are working with, because they are a makeup brand. So at the beginning, they would choose the cosmetic the, the the KOLs that are focusing on cosmetics category or makeup category. They would share their makeup tips or makeup look. They would try different shades of the lipsticks or eyeshadow and then post on uh, red. And then they expand uh, the KOLs selection. They would be working with more like lifestyle KOLs or different types of KOLs to you know reach a larger group of audience. So I think um, for brands, if you want to really have um, useful um, connections or useful communications with your followers, the first step is choose the right KOLs that can match your uh, brand image, that can produce really nice content. You can see the pictures, the videos are very important on Red. It has to be very attractive, very eye-catching so that people are willing to you know, click on your post and read more. So uh, first, you need to choose the KOLs that can really produce nice content and um, their content are a match to your brand image. So let's say if you are a premium brand, if you are a high-end brand, so you need to choose the KOLs that, that are posting about premium brand instead of really mass market brand. Because uh, in this case, you can actually reach the right people that you want to target. So the first step is to find the right KOLs. And the second step is to find uh, trendy content. So you have to really you know, stay updated, um, keep up to date to know what is trendy, what is popular on the platform, because it changes every day. Um, the hot topics, the trendy style. So you have to um, keep up to date to understand the platform, what is going on, what is trendy, so that you know what kind of content would be attractive, or even some keywords, what kind of keywords would be uh, useful or attractive to our customers. So I guess these are two most important things for brands to launch a successful KOL campaign. Okay, so this is about uh, Little Red Book. And next, I will talk about Bilibili. Um, so this platform is also, I think, also another very important platform for uh, beauty brands if you want to reach Gen Zers, because this, I think this is the uh, 
the, the Gen Zers' favorite platform, Bilibili. So first, Bilibili is a video platform. So some of you may see it as a Chinese version of YouTube. Um, but in my opinion, I think it's more than just a video platform. I think it's also an online entertainment community. Basically, you can find all kinds of uh, stuff that all, kind, all kinds of content that Gen Zers like on this platform. And they are willing to uh, communicate with each other in this community. Uh, you can find all kinds of like drama shows, movies, TV shows, or some uh, comics, animations, games, or beauty, lifestyle, fashion, or technology, science related videos or even online course, you can find everything that Gen Zers want to watch on this platform. So I think this is more than just a video platform. It represents some kind of culture among the Gen Zers. And um, why is it the favorite platform of Gen Zers? So you can see that 80% of the users of Bilibili are under 35 years old. This is huge. Um, you can say for every two Gen Zers, one of them are on Bilibili. So basically, if you want to reach Gen Zers, Bilibili is a must have platform. So this is some basic figures. So now they have more than 200 million monthly active users, 54 million daily active users. So also huge, uh, huge user base. And they are developing really, really fast. So maybe two years ago you would think Bilibili is a very niche platform but now the content has become more and more mainstream so maybe before you think okay this platform is for uh comic fans or, or gamers but now you can see the content is more and more diversified and more and more mainstream you can see a lot of beauty bloggers posting videos uh, teach people how to do makeup or share their skincare routines here so i think um, for um, new brands or especially brands that work that want to target Gen Zers, you really need to you know look into Bilibili. And like I said, I think Bilibili is more than a video platform. It's more like an um, online entertainment community. So that's why I I put this you know relationship between the platform, the users, and the content creators because I think. Mm, it's like a Gen Z community. So for the users, they are the Gen Zers. So they um, they would bring the traffic and profits to the platform, and the platform would provide the content and community for the users. And the users themselves are also the content creators. So they would also um, shoot videos to to you know talk about their daily life or share um, products they like. So they are also the content creators. So for Billy Billy, it's more like a decentralized community. Um, the platform, they doesn't really control uh, everything. So they leave a lot of space for the content creators to create the videos that they like. So that's why you can see all kinds of different types of videos here. So any videos that you can imagine, you can find it here. So that's why uh, Gen Zers really love the community on Billy Billy. So how can brands use the platform? So it's the same. You can also uh, open an official account. You can also use your foreign entity to open the account, and then you can post videos. But I would suggest the brands uh, not just post the, the official videos, before, official shootings, because it's a little bit boring for Gen Zers on Bilibili. I would suggest brands to post um, Billy Billy style videos. So if you if you watch, you know what other brands are doing, you would you would know like what kind of videos are Gen Zers. It may be a little bit funny, or not that official or not that formal, but uh, you know more like have a closer have a closer relationship with the Gen Zers. This type of videos would be super popular on Billy Billy. So. If you want to really, you know, look into the platform, you can watch what beauty bloggers are posting or what other brands are doing um, on the platform. 
And besides posting videos, you can also um, host your own live streaming here. So it, it, it's possible for you to link your Bilibili account with your um, Tmall, Tmall shop. So if you have a shop on Tmall, you can link it with your Bilibili account so that when people are watching videos or uh, live streaming, they can go directly to your Tmall shop and purchase. So this is very convenient. And you can also have advertising here. So you, you can have banner ads, feed ads, and open screen ads. But I would suggest if you are uh, new to the market, if you don't have a lot of brand presence, maybe start from building your own content first, start from seeding first. So that's why I would suggest to work with the KOLs first. So the KOLs on uh, Bilibili, they are usually called uploaders. They can provide all kinds of mm, different types of the videos mm, for, you know, for brands. So they have uh, vlog, they have uh, makeup tutorials, um, they have um, like uh, product recommendations, uh, all kinds of different types of videos. So um, I think if a brand wants to work with KOLs, I think this, the same thing uh, like what you do on Red is that first you need to select the right KOLs that can match your brand image. And second, I think a uh, very important thing on Bilibili is trying to produce Bilibili style content, local content, instead of any content that you can see from any other platforms. Because um, Bilibili has its own unique culture and unique style. So you have to follow this style to reach the Bilibili users. The users, they, you know, they, they, they don't mind watching advertisements on the videos. They, 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 they don't mind watching the sponsored videos. They sometimes they know this is an ad from the KOL. They know, okay, this product is sponsored. They are still willing to watch it because as long as you your video is informative, as long as you can provide value to your followers, they are more than willing to watch it. So that's why the videos has to be localized, has to be, you know, match the the Billy Billy style so that you can reach the, the right audience. And uh, like I said, you can also put the Tmall link uh, on your video. So Bilibili has a platform called Huahua. So on this platform, you can uh, find all the KOLs and you can place the order directly and you can add your Tmall link. So if you have a Tmall shop, uh, they can, uh, there will be a link uh, under the video so they can, click on the link and they can go directly to your product page on Tmall. So um, it's uh, also very convenient for a call for action. And um, in terms of the case studies, I put another CBT brand, which is Floris's, Huaxizi. So this brand um, is also a makeup brand. Um, it's, mm, it's also one of the most successful cosmetics brands now. Um, but the marketing directions is totally different from Perfect Diary. So it's they 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 are both very successful, but they have very different strategies. So Floris is, is a very um, Chinese traditional has a has a Chinese traditional style. Uh, so if you if you see the products, if you see the packaging, you would know. Okay, this is a Chinese brand because the packaging, the, 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 the product style are very unique. It's, it's very easy to remember the, the brand, the, the whole brand image is very Chinese. So what they do is they have um, worked with hundreds of KOLs on Bilibili, including top ones, mid-tier ones, small ones, and ask them to produce really Chinese uh, traditional style video. And this is, you know, Chinese traditional style. Maybe uh, you think, okay, this is very traditional. Maybe it's for last generation, but no, this is actually totally for Gen Zers because um, we have a word called Guo Chao. So the Chinese traditional style are super popular among the Chinese young generation. 
they are actually looking for you know Chinese um, style products. So this is why florists are doing this on uh, Bilibili. They worked with hundreds of KOLs, produced really nice um, traditional style videos, and it's really, really fancy and nice. And um, the packaging, the products are very, you know, attractive, very eye-catching because it's very unique. You, if you see the product, you would remember it. It's totally different from any other international brand. So, so that's why it's super popular on the platform and a lot of users are, uh, you know, uh, engaging with the brand and then they also, you know, go to the Tmall shop for the purchase. So this is uh, what they do on Bilibili. And they would also be interacting with the audience through a unique language on Bilibili. It's called bullet screen. So you can see, um, uh, on Bilibili, you can send bullet screen. Uh, it's like um, it's it's like a bullet comments shooting from the right side of the screen. So that's why we call it bullet screen. So it's a unique language between the users and the KOLs on Bilibili. So uh, they are also interacting with the followers through sending bullet screen. So the followers they would send bullet bullet screen to you know talk about the brand, talk about the product or have questions. And the brand would also send bullet screen to answer the questions or also to reply them. So this is very unique, um, replying the comments in the bullet screen. And they, uh, how they choose the KOLs, they choose really uh, Billy Billy born KOL, which means these KOLs are born on the platform. They got famous on Bilibili. So that's why they are the most localized KOL on the platform. They understand the Bilibili users the best because they, they grew up here. Uh, they've been working on the videos. They've been talking to the, to the followers maybe for years. So that's why they understand what the followers really want to watch or how to communicate with them. So when you are choosing the KOLs, really try to find more localized KOLs. Uh, you know, they grew up here. Instead of, uh, you know, we have some KOLs that they may be popular on other platforms, like they may become famous on Weibo, on WeChat, and then they come to Little Red Book or Bilibili. So I would suggest you to choose the Bilibili born KOLs first, because this will be mm, most effective ways to reach the right audience. So this is uh, what florists are doing. And in the end, I want to share some um, uh, future trends that I think uh, beauty brands should pay attention to. Um, Gen Zers, I think they are chasing a very different lifestyle. So first, it's a healthy lifestyle. I think this is um, especially important uh, after the COVID because, um, you know, Actually, the Gen Zers, they are paying more attention on the ingredients, uh, if the ingredients are safe for their skin. And they're paying uh, more attention to uh, like clean beauty, if it's clean or if it's vegan or if it's cruelty free. I think it, the, for the young people, they're starting to realize the difference you know, between clean beauty and maybe traditional beauty brands. So that's why uh, we see a lot of Skin intellectuals, uh, in Chinese, it's called Chengfengdang. Skin intellectuals, this group of people, they pay a lot of attention to the ingredients. They would do a lot of research. They would know what kind of efficacy each ingredient has. So that's why th they are trying to choose, you know, more um, healthy or more effective ingredients. So that's why, like um, Teresa mentioned, superfoods, another new concept is also uh, becoming more popular in China. So that's why they are chasing, because they are chasing a healthy lifestyle. And the second one is, second trend is, they're also chasing a personal joy lifestyle. So when you are purchasing um, skincare or cosmetics products, when you are doing the makeup, it's not for anyone, it's just for yourself. It's just for, um, I'm happy about, you know, have a good, makeup look. So that's why I'm wearing the makeup 
I'm not really wearing the makeup for my boyfriend or or my friends. I'm just wearing the makeup for myself. This kind of personal joy lifestyle is also very important. That's why people are paying more attention to what, to the uniqueness, to the niche beauty, because they don't want to look just like anyone else. They want to be unique. So that's why they are looking for more niche brands instead of just using, you know, mass market brands or all the big, big names that everyone is using. So that's why, you know, in recent um, one or two years, the American niche beauty brands are becoming also very popular in China. This is because the young people, they are chasing a unique lifestyle and they want to be more diversified and more inclusive. So maybe uh, before you would think uh, I have to be, you know, very fit. Uh, I can't wear the, the plus size coat because uh, this is what people think what people define, how people define beauty. But now it's becoming more and more diversified. So that's why uh, more and more Gen Z consumers, they are not chasing whitening or uh, you know, anti-aging um, efficacy. They want to be more and more diversified. They think maybe uh, a tan tone, a tan skin tone can also be you know, very good looking. So this is another personal joy um, trend. And the third one is women empowerment. So the women in China, they are starting to speak for themselves. They are, like I said, I'm wearing the makeup just for myself, not for anyone else, not for any man. So that's why uh, you can see the unisex beauty is becoming, you know, uh, popular now. And also they would care the social responsibility, the brand's social responsibility. If they pay attention to the women empowerment. Actually, a lot of you know brands um, had some mm, bad moments on this because mm -hmm. they are not paying attention to the to the women customers. Yeah. The customers would think they don't have any social responsibility. So that's why um, this is also very important. And it's more and more female driven. So um, I think it's connected to the personal joy lifestyle. So these are the three future trends that I think um, Gen Zers are chasing. So I hope that um, this can be some reference for uh, the beauty brands. If you want to you know, uh, launch new products or if you want to uh, launch uh, campaigns in China. So yeah, that's my presentation today. And if you want to learn more about Little Red Book or uh, the Chinese beauty brands, how do they succeed? You can, uh, you know, we have two reports. One is the guide to Xia Hongshu. Another is the uh, secrets to success for the C beauty brands. So you can scan the QR code or you can send me an email. You can add me on WeChat. Yeah, I can send you a copy of this report. So yeah, thanks everyone. Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks Mira. Thank you. Okay, we, we, we come to our last section as the Q&A. Uh, we, we have a lot of questions right now uh, raised from our attendees to our three speakers. So I have one question is to Apple. Apple, are you still there? Oh, I think Apple may have some. Okay, Mira, we have fresh questions here. Uh, one question is in China, many emerging brands become popular because of KOLs and the influencers. So please uh, kindly advise how to well work with KOLs to promote the brand. Okay, um, that's a very big question working with <laughs> KOLs because yeah, like I said, um, first step is really try to find the right KOLs that can match your brand image. Like you really need to investigate what the KOLs have been posting, uh, you know, like uh, what kind of content they're doing. For example, if you're a beauty brand, but the KOL is posting, all the posts are about food, then it doesn't really match your brand, right? So I think the yeah. first step is really find the right KOLs. And maybe the second is, uh, try to you know understand each platform because each platform is different. The KOLs type, the content type are all different. So you may need to really understand what kind of content will be popular, will be attractive on the platform. 
and then you need to uh, you know brief the KOLs to ask them to produce this kind of uh, really popular content on the platform. So I think um, for brands, what you can do is uh, really to try to understand more uh, about each platform and try to be localized, um, no matter uh, in the content or in the KOL selection. Uh, and when I say localized, I mean not only localized for China, but localized for each Chinese platform because it's totally different and you really need to understand it first. So uh, after you understand it, you will know what kind of KOLs you should work with, what kind of um, content you should post. And if you still are confused, maybe just you know look at the successful case. Try to study from other people. Try to study from other brands. What, what KOLs do they work with? Try to find a similar type of KOLs. So yeah, this is my... Uh, yeah. Quick advice. Yeah, very good, very good advice on how to work with KOL and learn from the cases you have just to share with us. And thanks, uh, Mira. Uh, Teresa, are you there? Hello, Teresa, are you still there? Yeah, we think that uh, we still have leave a lot of questions from our attendees, but uh, we may collect and uh, later to connect with our speakers uh, to let them to answer your questions through our community. So uh, thanks for the sharing. We are going to wrap up the sections today. And the opportunity of Chinese market is real, but it's only getting more competitive. Success requires an understanding of the dynamic retail landscape and the widely sophisticated consumers, as well as the market ecosystems. So I would thanks to our panels, Mark, April, Teresa, Mira, join us today to put so much great presentations all together. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining today. Beauty Academy will continue to organize a series of webinars on hot beauty topics in the upcoming months. So please register on beautysourcing.com to check the detailed schedule and kindly arrange your times to join. We wish you a good day. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.